Greetings sports fans, welcome to another episode of Sports Down the Middle, the channel of undiluted sports content and reviews. We hope that you enjoyed our last video. If you have not subscribed as yet, please click on the subscription button below and hit the notification bell to ensure you get notified as soon as a video is released. Today we conclude the second in a two-part series with former JFF Marketing and Business Development Director Sophia Harris. We left off by asking her if given that all that had transpired recently with the Jamaica Football Federation, if the JFF president, Mike Ricketts, and his team should resign. Let's listen in on what she had to say and the conclusion of those discussions. There have been clamors in the football space and locally for the resignation of the JFF hierarchy. Um, do you think they should resign? Do you think there needs to be a restructure on the leadership? No, I don't think they should resign because I can honestly say we, we're all flawed people, but Michael Ricketts and Dalton Wint, having worked them, they have good hearts. What they need is a good professional supporting um, administrative staff because what is the hierarchy there none of them are supposed to be involved in day-to-day -day operations mm -hmm. there are very few people that are involved in day-to-day -day operations you know and all, I, I mean i don't want to say all of them but a good number of them need to either be retrained or replaced and these are the people who are involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the national program and football development and and while i was there the jff general secretary took steps to send some of these people to training but there's also a mindset issue where if you truly believe the old way of doing things is the right way, then you don't have a place in the new JFF, which Fair is enough. aligned with international football. You know, it's Fair just as simple as that. I see that you did another accomplishment for the JFF, right? I uh, see that you, you, um, you had a four-year deal with, a Brit, uh, with, with Umber. So why did you leave the JFF? <laughs> All right. So... Um, I've been asked this question a lot. So what I will say is that the same things I mentioned a while ago about the restructuring best practices, standard operating procedures and retrained or replaced senior administration who are involved in day to day, because I'm only one person. Yeah. And there are departments that need to be overhauled and it needs to be done from the top down. And mm -hmm. then you have a board who they have a long history with the Federation and you have staff there that have a long history with the Federation. And then you have these two new people coming and say, but I don't want to just fire people, big hearts. But yeah. the truth of the matter is sometimes as a leader, you have to make tough decisions and stand by them, no matter what the consequences. And I think that is what the issue is. And for me, I've always worked with very powerful leaders. So you mentioned earlier about, um why you chose football but um i know that marketing in general is is broad so what is the difference between marketing a sport versus marketing uh, a product or a brand or a service that's a very very good question and i can tell you that it really starts off with, it, it, there are, there's not much difference because a consumer is a consumer, right? You just have to profile your consumer. So once you start with the consumer, it's really the same principles, but you have to tailor the solutions to suit the circumstance. So I start off with an audit as to profiling the consumer. We have a lot of stats or data at the JFF, which is something I think that needs to change. If it's one thing I can say is that the collection of data, statistics, and I know for one, Tapper has always been saying he wants the analytical software. He wants he wants to have access to more data, Heard that? which I support. On. Yeah, man, I supported him on a hundred million percent. But it was I was leaving when I was working on getting that sponsors for him. So maybe I can throw that out there. <laughs> they need that. That's, a, but, that's an interesting one to know. Yeah, man, Tapper is. Tapa is very smart. He's my coach, you know, and no matter how I want to cuss him, I love him. I think he's talented. Again, support systems, you yeah. know, and it takes a team. And without the right support system for him, he's there's only so much he can do against the odds, you know? So, 
Um, yeah, it's stats and data. So for me, I did an audit. And once you realize, all right, who are the consumers? Who are the sports consumers different from other consumers? What are their preferences? What are their behaviors? How do they think? And what will get them out to a stadium that's not a world-class stadium when people can now travel around the world and attend world-class events? And I was trying to explain to the people there, you know, when I got there that it's not the same consumer that could only had JBC or TVJ to watch sports. They can now click I'm on global. ESPN, YouTube, at their convenience. Watch Regional and global. So you're competing against global events. What is going to make it different? I said, and I, one of the big debates that I pushed while I was there, and I, I'll leave that to you to discuss another time because I think it's very interesting. What differentiates the fans of high school football from the fans of international football? And I kept saying that the high school experience for Jamaicans is a huge part of their adult development. Yep. And so we have an emotional attachment. People buy for emotional reasons. And that's something that I learned as marketing, as a general rule that so you apply to sports. You have to have that emotional connection. There is no, there's not as much emotional tie to your country. <laughs> because people will say, what has Jamaica Brand, done for me? Brand Jamaica, really? Listen, Brand Jamaica cannot cannot come close to the JC man, the KC man, the Calabar man, the man and him school. And the difference is that school helped me be who I am today. I have sure. most of my great memories growing up were at that school. That school yeah. helped develop me. What has my country done for me? When the boys go and qualify for the World Cup now, now you're going to say, oh yeah, that's when the fans come out. Why? Because my country is something for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's that emotional attachment. It's that inspiration. And we're not winning enough as a nation. We win in music. But in sports, when Bolt was there, he drew a lot of that emotion to, to track. Football was not inspiring that. So the national football program was not winning enough. And I kept saying, you have to win. I'm saying we can't compete with that. That's why Manning Cup will always ram. Because of that emotional connection. Because they... Yeah. They represent a part of us. Listen, it take, a, it take a World Cup qualification or a gold medal for Jamaican people to even look at national football or, or sports programs. Yeah, Other right, than that, right. definitely. Yeah. You're right. So, it's, so right. you ask about the marketing, and so you definitely. take those broad concepts and you find the emotional side of it. And then habits. All consumers were turning to these. Phones. So once you understand changing habits, you know, say, okay, we need to be in a digital space or we need brands. There was no reggae boys logo. There was no reggae girls logo. So I had to start off with developing the assets, the profiles, who are the players, interviewing them. So you take the, the broader marketing principles and you tailor it for the unique situation. So it's, it's just about being flexible and have an understanding of it on a psychology, psychological level. Okay, okay. great. Go ahead, Ricardo. All right, so I'm going to ask you a question about the, the diaspora. How can the diaspora help in growing Jamaican football or the sports brand? When, when I travel with the teams, um, there are a lot of people in the diaspora who want to help develop their home country. Again, there was a stigma with the Federation. They would give money to anybody else except the Federation. And... That stigma, I think, is worse, is, is, is more amplified within the diaspora than it is locally. So exactly. there's a trust issue. Because remember, it has to, the money has to you know, cross borders, you know, and you, you lose control of it. So it was me, and, and anyway, I <laughs> spearheaded, organized, finalized the negotiations and the paperwork for the formation of the Reggae Girls Foundation, Excellent. right? And I said, next, we need a Reggae Boys Foundation. Now, there were a team of women who wanted it, but if, if I had not done what I did as the intermediary and the organizer, it would not have happened. And I'm straight out saying that. I said to them, next, what you need is a Reggae Boys Foundation. Reggae Boys Foundation, yeah. In the diaspora. At the time, the boys were not performing as well. And so, you know, the interest and the excitement was around the girls. And I kept saying to them, you need to find some key players in the diaspora to lead this effort. Because you have all these charters in Miami, New York, and they're, you know, even the high schools have their, their, their charters throughout North America, mm -hmm. even in Canada. 
you bring out the leaders from all of these and have them run the Reggae Boys Foundation. And then we can, what we did was put organizing legal documents and terms exactly what areas the money would be used for. And then so, there were all and so on. So, so pretty much, Sophie, what you have outlined is a kind of funding model that would help in terms of the Reggae Boys and the, the Reggae Girls um, per se. And that yes. would heavily depend on the death for who is a big part of the market. Yes, because you know what? It's easier for them. Listen, I saw, I became good friends with um, Golden Crust and they went and raised, I think it was 25 grand for the Reggae Girls at one point when I was in talks with them when I was there. It's easier for them to reach out to people and say, donate $10 each, $100 each, and get to that figure than it is for me to go to corporate Jamaica here and get that money. Yeah, so, yeah. Believe, because it's a bigger market and there's a lot of emotional, again, we go back to the emotive, a lot emotional. of emotional attachment to their home country because there's nostalgia and all of that stuff. People want to give back, but they have to trust. It's easy for them to trust an organization, a centralized thing built, run by 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 figureheads that they trust. Just like right. how the, the, the Premier League is now being spearheaded by Chris Willey, a person yeah. who we trust. Professional football Jamaica. Yes, a person that people trust. So he's going to be able to do that as a, as a reputable persona. The diaspora can do that also. And I was pushing also for the tourist board and diaspora to put on these, these friendly matches in Jamaica. You know, I mean, I had big plans, you know. <laughs> <laughs> With my one tear, I had big plans I can, because I, I, can, I saw the potential. I, can, I, 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 I wanted Brazil women national team to play the Bra the reggae girls, paid fully, fully by the diaspora. They alone must pay for it. Well, 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 guess what, Sophia? We're going to join you on the diaspora campaign, <laughs> right? Sports DTM is going to join you on that diaspora campaign listen, to see if we can get that much needed listen, funding. It's easier for them to raise that money. It, and, and we can't afford a Brazil men's team. That's a million US. There are boats, right? Yeah, man. Yeah. I, I learned some stuff. You can't. But we could afford the women's team. Now yeah. imagine our reggae girls versus a Brazil women's team. Yeah, yep. We don't spend a dollar. The diaspora could pay for that easily. It's, that sounds like a very good plan. Sounds like a very good plan. But, but let me segue a little bit there, um, Sophia. Um, you spoke about Chris Williams and professional football Jamaica. And um, globally, the pandemic um, has disrupted, COVID has disrupted sports in Jamaica. Um, how, um, give us a thought on, on, on the no restart of sports in Jamaica. Uh, I think the sports that are organized, that plan and approach the thing approach the, the governing bodies with a plan, structure, transparency, get a lot further, a lot faster. So for example, I heard, I think it was horse racing or someone that said, listen, we're starting on this date. And they just started a process to get organized, prepare documents, have transparent communication, and we're fully in the media talking about what they were doing. Now, if you don't have transparency and open communication, there's no pressure on the government to do anything. If you have talks behind closed doors, then what will happen will happen because the public has no interest. The public did not know about what was going on, as far as I know, in terms of when communication went in, when meetings happened, what was put to the table for the ministry to review and what the response is. So yeah. I'm saying in, involve the public, lay out a plan, publish it in the papers and say, this is the plan that we're putting to the government and make sure it is properly vetted and has all the protocols observed so that they can't come back and say, oh, you left something off because the public would have alerted you long before. So it's about transparency. And I, for one, I'm a big, big proponent of transparent public relations, which is a weak area at the Federation, but it's something that could be a, a game changer for them. Quite so, quite so. Um, and following up on that um, pandemic question, how do you um, suppose that this will impact sports in um, Jamaica's preparation for like, for example, the World Cup, the, World the Olympics? Cup. All right, so I don't really foresee, to be honest, um, because it's such of a contact sport. It's not like horse racing or golf where it's an individualist or track. There's a lot of contact in football, but football has resumed in other places in the world. So it's a matter of 
proper planning and the trust that the government must have that the, the governing body of football will implement the thing in a way that is going to be properly micromanaged and implemented successfully. So th there's trust, there's transparency. I don't foresee football starting again until maybe another four months from now, simply because wow. we have yet to see the results of the Christmas and the spike wow. We are still uncovering variances of the, the COVID um, virus within the country. Americanized identified about 50 people carrying the variant. And we have let a lot of travelers into the, into the country. So we haven't even, remember it takes, like, it's an incubation period, you know, so we don't know yet. So until we know and we start to see a spike maybe at the end of January, that would determine the level of concern with the, with the government, right? If we don't see a spike and we were able to manage it, sufficiently in December, then as soon as maybe March. But like I said, it's also proper planning and transparent negotiations. Now, I know Chris Willey is, is very, very good at that. He's a professional. So if he's spearheading those conversations, he'll do the interviews. He'll let everybody know what's happening. And he will be aggressive in ensuring that he's putting his best foot forward and letting everybody know and, and really tackling this thing full force. The Federation needs to approach it that way. Um, mm -hmm. There are, there, I think there's a, there's a FIFA window in, in March and the boards March, are supposed yeah. to have their qualifications, right? right? So, but that's a way in terms of local. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Like I said, it can be March and it can be June. Yeah. That's where yeah. I see. I'm, I'm going to leave. I'm going to have about, uh, I'm going to wrap up pretty quickly. So I'm going to have my two um, fellow inter, um, colleagues to actually give their final questions. Um, Ricardo? All right. Um, if LGC had the opportunity to work with a national team in this dispensation, what is the first thing you will do? Well, LGC, as a consultant, I was able to do what I could do because I was senior and I had a certain amount of influence and power and I utilized it. As a consultant, I would have to be ensured to have the same amount of power to get things done. Otherwise, I'm just another voice that's going to be drowned out by the system. So I would have to be empowered by the board to have certain authorities. And they already know what I can do and they trust me. So it's really up to them. But I would be more than willing to, to help them because I have an understanding of how the pandemic is affecting sports globally. Yeah. And I keep abreast of trends, global trends. And I understand the sport now better than anybody that I know on an international level. Fair so I'm, I have a good relationship with the people at FIFA and CONCACAF. They know me, you know, it's better than bringing in people that they don't know. I have a reputation. We work together to execute local games and we have a good rapport and they really like the work that I was doing. So it would just be a continuation and, and Corporate Jamaica saw what I did. It was not an easy feat when Digicel decided they were going to bring them back, you know. Right. That in itself was a miracle because they had just left, right? <laughs> and it was a very public exiting of the national program for me to woo them back in and say, please, you know, and to keep the likes of Owisinko, St. Mary's. I mean, remember, you know, we had Apple come down to Jamaica with the iPhone and film oh, the yes. reggae girls and put on their Instagram page. Oh, these things it's an understanding of local and, and global and developing a global strategy because you know how to work with people you know how to treat people you know how to present yourself as an international business person if you don't speak that language they're not going to listen to you not going to listen you can't get anywhere with them so i think lgc could help i i, I know that for sure but like i said there they are caveats and i I believe that no matter what has happened, every day is a new day to do better and the GFF can resolve all of its issues and do extremely well. Fair enough, fair enough. Tyrone, Thank you question. very much. Thank all right, uh, Ms. Harris, uh, any advice for, for young people who want to enter in marketing? <clears throat> oh yeah, I have tons. I, I love young people because young people are the future and they grew up in, a, in an era of technology that Listen, I was from the time of dial-up phone, you know, I was telling somebody the other day, I'm from the time where, you know, when internet has the dial-up and you, you hear the internet ringing. 
<laughs> That's how old I am. So oh I am, listen, I'm a fan of young people. And I would say to anyone wanting to enter marketing or any professional field, study, read, hang around people smarter than you and understand what you don't know. Open your mind and absorb as much information from people from all walks of life because the CEO can have something valuable to offer you, so can the janitor, so can the old lady in the country because everybody right. has something valuable, you know? But be in a constant state of learning and, and expose yourself to the world because Jamaica no longer exists as, a, as a, an island in the sun. We are now part of a global market. Great, great. All right, great. Um, all right, so let me put in my final question. All right, okay. Sophia. Uh oh. Tell me what are your the challenges that you're facing in terms of any failed negotiations, your major achievements. Um, tell me a little bit about that. So I can successfully say I've never failed at a negotiation. Oh, I love it. Never, never. And it's because, like I said before, I believe in preparing. You must always be prepared for a meeting. You Preparation. must always be the most prepared person in the room. And, and a negotiator never bluffs, a true negotiator. And I always tell people that and they laugh at me and I say, yeah, I've never bluffed. You always be prepared to walk away from the table in, in reality and not know when to walk away. You always know when to walk away. Like um, Kenny Rogers. Uh, Kenny Rogers. <laughs> <laughs> the gambler. Right? So you the have gambler. to be authentic, be prepared, know what your breaking point is. I've never ever lost a negotiation. I think my greatest success, wow. Um, when I was working at Gulfray, we were the first to enter the Cuban market. That's another story with oil. Right. <laughs> As an exporter. That for me was was great because it was a first. Um, being a part of the, the first women's world cup that the girls were a part of and to be able as a woman and advocate for females to be a part of that journey with them was amazing and as a mom of a girl so nice. you know and to be able to negotiate for their contracts for them that was that was a good one too so there i have a, i have quite a lot of wins and by the grace of god i've been very successful and i i hope i'll continue to be successful sounds, the sounds good pandemic <laughs> so, <laughs> sounds good to me uh, your final thoughts, Sophia, um, where can people find you? Where are you located? Social media handles. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I'm so honored. You brought out some great football memories. You know, I feel like shedding a tear. <laughs> so it's fabulous. And I will always be a part of football. I speak to the fraternity all the time. So I'm the CEO and founder of Lao Global Consulting. And the handles are at Lao Global Consulting. We are on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. The website is laoglobalconsulting.com. And... Um, yeah, I'm Jamaican based. I have a huge network across the globe, business and media. And uh, I'm, I'm here to help with most business professional services, including so global digital marketing, executive coaching, strategic partnerships, contract negotiations, anything at all to help your business grow, repurpose its business model and make money, which is what I've been doing for a very long time. Football is a little detour, but I am so grateful for that experience. And thank you for having me on, guys. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a Harris. pleasure having it you. It was a pleasure. Sophia Harris, she's the former director of marketing and business development at the JFF, the Sports DTM family. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, listeners, if you enjoyed our interview, we want you to share, leave a comment in the comment section below. We want you to like, share, and subscribe. If you like the discussion surrounding sponsorship, the brand, the marketing, uh, the diaspora, share your thoughts. Join on board. This has been another episode of Sports Down the Middle. Be blessed.